The next item of business is the debate on motion 3985 in the name of Ariane Burgess on behalf of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee on National Planning Framework 4. In the unexplained absence of the convener, can I call on the Deputy Convener, uh, Willie Coffey, uh, to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee uh, for around eight minutes, Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I uh, thought I was closing the debate, so this is a closing speech, as I'm sure members will, <laughs> will say here. Uh, I'll move the motion in my name, Presiding Officer, before I forget. So I'm very pleased to be opening this important debate on behalf of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. And firstly, of course, to thank the committee members for their contribution during the process and to our clerking team and SPICE for their help and much valued guidance along the way. From my perspective, this debate has been immensely constructive and I hope it has been helpful in shaping the final version of NPF 4 and a planning system and culture well suited to delivering on its ambitions. Before reflecting on some of the contributions to this afternoon's debate, which I am about to hear, <laughs> I wanted to highlight some of the other key conclusions of a report that have not been covered by the convener in her opening remarks. <laughs> Firstly, I wanted to say a few words, members, about the concept of the 20-minute neighbourhoods, which is a key part of NPF 4 that members will agree and recognise. The committee welcomed the 20-minute neighbourhoods and we note... Mr Coffey, could I just, could I just perhaps pause you there? Um, it is not a reflection on your remarks, but I don't think this is reflecting particularly well on the uh, chamber. So I think I'm going to suspend um, business um, for, a, for a brief um, period until we establish where the convener is and we can recommence the, uh, the debate. But thank you very much okay. indeed for your, for your attempt to, uh, to allow us <laughs> to stay on track. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the second time of asking the next item of business is a debate on motion 3985 in the name of Ariane Burgess on behalf of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee on National Planning Framework uh, 4. I would invite members who wish to participate in the debate to press the request speak button. I place an R in the chat function uh, now or as soon as possible. Uh, I would call on Ariane Burgess to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, but make absolutely clear uh, how seriously I, I take the discourtesy to this chamber of the convener not being present for the start of the debate. Ms Burgess, for around eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and apologies for my delay. The committee is very pleased to have this opportunity today to debate the draft of the fourth national planning framework. MPF 4 sets out the Scottish Government's strategy for Scotland's long-term development and guides decisions on every application for planning permission submitted in Scotland. It sets out how places and environments will be planned and designed for years to come. NPF 4 will be of particular importance in ensuring that we make planning decisions that respond effectively to the climate and biodiversity emergencies. Planning affects so many different aspects of our lives, from where we live to where we work, to where we go to school, to job opportunities, and to our health and well-being, to name just a few. Given the huge breadth of impact planning has, I'm very pleased that the Health, Social Care and Sports Committee, the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, and Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee have all considered the draft MPF 4.2 and are all contributing to this debate today. I also want to thank all those groups who informed both our formal and our informal sessions. Your contributions were immensely helpful to us. There is a lot resting on the success of MPF 4, and it is essential that we get it right. And as a committee, members, we were all agreed that there is a lot about the draft MPF 4 that the Scottish Government has got right. The committee certainly welcomes the ambition of the draft MPF 4. However, there are ways in which we think 
that both MPF4 and the current planning system could be improved to better deliver these laudable ambitions. Perhaps of greatest concern to the committee is the capacity of planning departments to deliver on MPF4. We were told by stakeholders that planning departments in Scotland have collectively experienced 42% cuts in real terms since 2009. Having properly resourced planning departments will be essential to the success of MPF4. We were told by a number of stakeholders that there was a need for 700 new planners over the next 10 to 15 years, given the loss of planners from cuts and the ageing profile of the current workforce. The committee welcomes the Minister's recognition of this very significant obstacle to the success of MPF4. The committee welcomes, too, the Minister's commitment to exploring the potential for full cost recovery as a means to better fund planning departments. However, given the current state of local authority planning departments, it is debatable whether even with full cost recovery, local authority planning departments will have the resources to move toward the kind of public-led planning the committee considers is necessary to realise the ambitions of MPF4. At the very least, it will be key that any funding coming to local authorities from full cost of recovery is retained by planning departments. MPF4 requires a very different kind of approach to planning, and so increased numbers of planners will not in and of itself affect change in how we make planning decisions in Scotland. Both current and new planners must be given the training and skills to work in this new environment. Moreover, for planners to deliver on the ambitions in a clear and consistent way, they need to be clear on how to apply the MPF4's priorities. In some cases, planners told us that MPF4 did not give them that clarity. Several witnesses asked for clarity on how developers and decision makers should balance or prioritise the four priorities set out in the National Spatial Strategy, the six spatial principles, the development priorities set out in the five action areas, and individual planning policies. We understand that it is for decision makers to make an informed judgment on a case-by-case -case basis, but the committee believes that greater clarity on priorities is required if the ambitions of MPF4 are to be delivered in a coherent and consistent way. We would welcome the Minister's reflections today on what more could be done to provide decision makers with that clarity and certainty they are seeking. The committee also considers that more clarity and certainty is needed in the choice of language in some cases to support the delivery of the ambitions of the MPF4. Several witnesses raised concerns about a lack of... Uh, yes. Graham Simpson. Can I thank Arian Burgess for taking the intervention. Uh, when she calls for more clarity, does she agree with me that large chunks of the, the draft document need to be rewritten? Arian Burgess. Thank you for that. Um, I don't think necessarily large chunks need to be written, um, and, but I do think there does need to be greater clarity um, to deliver the, the ambitions. And as I, I'm just going to continue on to say that several witnesses raised concerns about the lack of clarity and certainty for decision makers in the wording of some of the policies, highlighting the use of words such as should or supported rather than must or approved. And I think there are ways that the government can um, find that wording that absolutely stresses that clarity uh, in this changed planning landscape. MPF 4 should be accessible and a usable document, and it is of concern uh, to us that there is uncertainty about the meaning of terms and words. It's particularly concerning that these issues are being highlighted to the committee by people very familiar with the planning system. We would welcome the Minister's further reflections today on the comments made to the Committee about the language used in MPF4, as well as his thoughts on how to create greater clarity and certainty. As I said at the beginning of this speech, a key focus of MPF4 must be the climate and biodiversity emergency. And the Committee wholeheartedly supports the prominence given to both the climate and biodiversity emergency in MPF4. It is essential, though, that this prominence is reflected in planning decisions. This will require significant change in approach 
for the planning system, and it would be good to hear more from the Minister today as to how planners will be supported to drive that change and balance it against competing priorities. As a committee, we agreed that for MPF4 to be successful, there needs to be a public-led planning system. For that to happen, we need to have informed and engaged communities all across Scotland. We would welcome the Minister's reflection on what more can be done to ensure that communities are supported to engage in shaping the places where they live, particularly communities from more disadvantaged areas. We would also welcome the Minister's thoughts on what more can be done to alleviate consultation fatigue. It's particular, in particular, what can we do to ensure that consultation is undertaken timiously and communities are involved in a collaborative rather than solely a consultative manner. MPF4 is a long-term plan and we need to be able to check on a regular basis that it is delivering on its ambitions and affecting change in Scotland's communities. We need to properly monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of MPF4 and how it is being delivered by local communities. We would welcome a commitment from the Minister to producing an annual evaluation of MPF4 against the outcomes set out in the Town and Country Planning Act, Scotland Act 1997. We would also welcome the Minister's reflections on how benchmarking in local government could be used to ensure that the ambitions of MPF4 can be delivered. We ask the Scottish Government to take on board the issues I have set out today, as well as those already set out in the contributions from my committee and other committees as it develops a final version of MPF4. When it comes to scrutinising that final version, the committee remains concerned that it will not have sufficient opportunity to do so. It's conceivable that a final version will be materially different from the draft version. You need to conclude now, Ms Burgess. I'm, I'm winding up, thank you. The committee welcomes the Minister's commitment to appear before it on the final version of MPF4. The committee would welcome an assurance today from the Minister that sufficient time will be allowed to the committee to undertake thorough scrutiny you of the final... You need to conclude. Uh, ..before the Parliament is invited to improve it. I look forward to hearing the rest of the contributions in this debate, and I move the motion in my name on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. I can advise the Chamber that as a result of the delayed start to the debate, we now have no more time in hand, so speeches will have to be two time and interventions incorporated in those speeches. And I call on Gillian Martin to speak on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Support Committee uh, for up to six minutes, please, Ms Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this important cross-committee debate on the National Planning Framework 4. The Health, Social Care and Sport Committee took evidence on MPF4 in late January, and our specific focus was to consider its cont contribution towards improving health and well-being. For understandable reasons, MPF4 has an overarching strategic focus on climate and nature, making sure planning policy contributes positively tackling climate change and biodiversity loss. However, witnesses given evidence to our committee argued that improving health and well-being and reducing health inequalities are equally important strategic priorities for planning policy. We face many health-related challenges where planning policy can make a real difference. Tackling obesity, for instance, where too much access to unhealthy fast foods in local communities makes matters worse and where improving local availability and affordability of healthy, high-quality food would vastly improve the situation. Yes, I will. Alec Rowley. Thank you to Gillian Martin for taking that intervention. I notice that the Scottish Sport Association have argued that, along with the proposed assessment on greenhouse gas emissions, an assessment on the impact of sport, physical activity of any proposed planning development should be in there. Is that something the committee considered? Gillian Martin. Uh, we, we didn't have that directly in evidence, but I'd be interested to look at what they've, they've said, because I, I think that comes part of the whole wellbeing aspect to MPF4 as well. So I think that's an important point that's, that's just been made. Um, also, increased availability of gambling outlets in local high streets, particularly more deprived communities, can have a detrimental impact on mental health. When taking planning decisions, we need to take these wider impacts on health and well-being properly into account. And to ensure the health implications of individual planning decisions are more carefully considered, we have requested improved guidance for planning authorities 
but also robust processes for the elected members when making decisions on health grounds. Ultimately, if we are serious about making improved health and wellbeing a core objective of MPF4, um, we need to look at ways of making potential impacts on health and wellbeing a material consideration in determining future planning applications where those impacts are likely to be significant, because that is not the case at the moment. We welcome MPF4's ambition that future places could be designed for lifelong health and wellbeing. We also welcome the National Spatial Strategy's vision that our future places, homes and neighbourhoods will be better, healthier and more vibrant places place to live. And I guess that, that speaks to Ali, what Ali Rowley intervened on me with. The Spatial Planning, Health and Wellbeing Collaborative Group have recently produced a set of place and wellbeing outcomes. Witnesses told our committee that these place and wellbeing outcomes describe what every place needs for everyone in them to thrive. Um, in recent years, we have also seen many low-density housing developments spring up on the edge of Scottish towns. Um, and these could be very car-reliant uh, and lim had limited public transport provision. And these trends could risk storing up physical and mental health problems for the future. And, and that's why it's so important that we make health and well-being a strategic priority for MPF4 and an equal footing with climate and nature. Otherwise, we won't meet the ambition that our future places, uh, homes and neighbourhoods are better, healthier and more vibrant places to live. Our committee welcomes efforts to promote the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods and the health and well-being benefits they could bring. But at the same time, we do need to be clearer about the objective that underlies this concept. Witnesses giving evidence to our committee argue strongly for a, a very flexible approach that recognises a huge variation in different communities uh, and neighbourhoods across Scotland, and not least in, in rural communities. In essence, the 20-minute neighbourhoods are about improving quality of access to key local services. And that is a concept that could be applied equally to neighbourhoods in central Aberdeen, Dundee or Glasgow, as well as rural parts of Aberdeenshire and the Highlands and the borders. Dr Math, Matt Lowther from, the Public, from Public Health Scotland told our committee we should not get too hung, hung up on the 20-minute aspect of things. I also want to draw attention to the pivotal role played by health and care partnerships, territorial health, health boards and the third sector in contributing to effective strategic planning of future health and care service provision. And that role needs to be more prominently recognised in MPF4. To be confident that we continue to have local health and care services our local communities want and need, we need to involve these parties as strategic partners from the very outset of the preparation of any new local development plan. And as I've already mentioned, MPF4 can play a critical role in improving our future health and well-being, but it has an equally important role to play in addressing and tackling health inequalities. So we have planning policy that's genuinely responsive to the needs of different population groups, including those living in poverty or suffering from other types of disadvantage, or maybe who have been at the brunt of very bad planning decisions in the past. And we would advocate the wider use of health inequality impact assessments and giving our local decision makers the tools to implement them, as I've already said. In less than a month's time, we'll be having elections across our 32 local authorities, and local councillors and council officers will have a crucial role in uh, making MPF4 work in practice. And we have also recommended that the Scottish Government works with COSLA to develop and deliver a comprehensive programme of training for new councillors and council officials across Scotland. It, uh, MPF4 offers an important opportunity to put health and well-being at the heart of future planning policy, and we should seize that opportunity and do what we can to make that ambition a reality. President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Martin. And I now call on Finlay Carson to speak uh, on behalf of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment uh, Committee again for up to six minutes, Mr Carson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Many will say I do not often have a leg to stand on, and today I absolutely only literally have one leg to stand on, so it will give me an incentive to canter through this. Uh, so I can sit down, but with your permission, I may have to, to, uh, to revert to my seat. Uh, but uh, thank you. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this important debate on behalf of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee. And to support my committee's scrutiny of the draft uh, fourth national planning framework, we held an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands and the Minister for Public Finance, Planning, planning and Community Wealth on the 9th of February. And two of our members also contributed to the wider stakeholder engagement sessions hosted by Scottish Rural Action and Rural Housing Scotland, and we are grateful to those organisations for their insights and expertise. 
In our written responses to the Scottish Government, we highlighted five key areas where we consider the framework could be strengthened to support rural communities. These included the role of communities, uh, the role that communities play in the framework, the overall vision for rural communities set out in the framework, how the action areas in the frameworks are defined, how the MPF4 relates to other policies and strategy, and the lack of detail in the MPF4. Uh, I want to begin this afternoon by focusing on how we engage constructively with communities to inform how we make planning decisions. As we heard from one stakeholder at the engagement sessions, community engagement should be the golden thread running through MPF4, and my committee share this view. We con concluded that the role of communities, particularly those in more rural areas, should be expressed more explicitly in the framework. We also propose that MPF4 should establish a formal mechanism whereby the views of communities are heard in planning decisions and, that needs, and the needs of those communities are central to the decision making. My committee also called for the framework to have greater clarity of vision to adequately support Scotland's most vulnerable communities. We only need to look at the recently published National Island Plan Annual Review to see the stark downturn in population in some of our island communities. At the stakeholder event, colleagues heard about the central role housing plays in supporting rural repopulation. Having timely, adequate and affordable housing is key to retaining and attracting people to our communities. And the Scottish Land Commission made a number of proposals on how land market reform and land, planning, land use planning could help deliver more affordable homes supporting uh, repopulation. But perhaps the most important finding in the research on land for rural housing was that, with large house builders mainly inactive in rural Scotland, if new homes are to be built, then other developers such as community bodies and small and medium enterprises will absolutely need to have a role in developing these new houses. The committee also raised concerns that the action areas in the draft MPF4 are not well defined. The North and West Coastal Innovation Area, for example, is made up of communities that are very different, particularly in terms of population and size, and therefore have, a very, uh, have very different needs. This highlighted, uh, uh, this highlighted a related concern that island communities were simply not well represented in the draft MPF4, and it needs to devote some attention to the needs of these communities specifically rather than as they existed within the defined action areas. When the action areas were explored in the community's evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary and Minister, it was stated that these actions are indicative and very much open for comment. This flexibility in how the action areas were viewed is welcome, but the committee nevertheless uh, considered that this needed to be better reflected in the plan itself. The committee also considered the relationship between MPF 4 and some wider policies and strategies and that could be more explicit uh, and MPF 4 could elaborate on how uh, conflicts between them are dealt with. For example, transport policies uh, such as the, the STPR uh, review and the Just Transition have a relationship with MPF 4, but the way in which they interact is not clear. These are policies that have a significant impact on rural communities and so the committee would welcome clarity on their interconnectedness and the final version. Uh, although the committee appreciates the Cabinet Secretary's assurances that, while it may not be explicit, neither the draft MPF4 or related strategies are considered in isolation, it also considers that the lack of direct reference to certain strategies does not leave a lack of clarity. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It does leave a lack of clarity about how these matters interrelate. The committee also considered the relationship between MPF 4 and the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill, and in particular the need for people in urban areas to have access to food growing areas. Stakeholders included Obesity Action Scotland, and they set out in their written evidence the importance of the food environment and the role of the MPF 4 in that regard. The committee considers the MPF 4 to be uh, significant in ensuring the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill can meet its aims. Finally, the lack of detail in the draft MPF 4 was something the committee also explored in evidence, and the minister emphasised that MPF 4 was not intended to be prescriptive in order to allow flexibility in the planning system. And while recognising this argument, the committee once again felt there are areas where further detail is required. For example, as I have already mentioned, there are issues in relation to rural housing that need to be addressed, such as a lack of affordable housing in rural areas, pricing young people out of the market, lack of housing, more generally preventing rural communities from being able to attract new residents, inability to succession plan on farms due to housing constraints, and often substandard housing for agricultural workers more generally. The current lack of detail in the plan does not make it clear how these issues will be addressed. 
The committee therefore considers that something more prescriptive is required for planners. This view is supported by Heads of Planning Scotland, who stated in their written submission uh, that draft MPF4 contained too many coulds and shoulds rather than directing change. This, is suggested, uh, this suggests planning officers themselves recognise the need for clearer guidance. Deputy Presiding Officer, in summary, MPF4 has the potential to deliver better support for rural communities in Scotland, but my committee considers that it would, be, uh, it would benefit from clearer vision for those communities. Those communities need to be more involved in the planning process and the policies to support rural communities need to be well defined and work coherently together. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Mr Carson. I now call on Dean Lockhart to speak uh, on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee again for up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. I am very pleased to contribute to this debate on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. The fourth national planning framework impacts on a number of policy areas that will be vital to meet Scotland's net zero ambitions. And on behalf of the committee, I place on record our thanks to everyone who has supported the parliamentary scrutiny of the draft framework, in particular the Local Government, Housing and Planning Committee for leading scrutiny of the framework across Parliament and across portfolio areas and committees. Um, I now turn to some of the key recommendations of the Net Zero Committee, which were based on the evidence sessions we held. At the outset, I think it is important to recognise that NPF 4 does demonstrate the necessary levels of ambition and takes a comprehensive approach to address a multitude of policy issues. So far, so good. But there are, as other uh, members have highlighted, a number of weaknesses in the draft framework that need to be addressed. First of all, the need for greater clarity. On the face of it, NPF 4 appears to recognise that the climate emergency, the nature crisis and the need for sustainable development are first considerations in a hierarchy of spatial planning interests. While this ambition is welcome, stakeholders have called for greater clarity on what this means in practice, on how planners are to use the framework to make decisions on the ground, and on how competing priorities are to be treated. Stakeholders also found the language used in the draft to be unhelpfully vague. Some thought that this could fail to sufficiently protect planners and their decisions. Now, the Scottish Government has received a significant volume of written evidence which addresses many of these concerns, and we do hope that when we see the final framework, a number of these uh, concerns will be addressed. A further key theme which has already been mentioned uh, in the evidence we heard was the critical role that, that uh, local government must play in delivering net zero targets. Stakeholders were unanimous in their concern, however, that local authorities do not have the necessary resources, budget or expertise to deliver on national targets. One particular area of concern is the depletion of resources and specialist skills within council planning departments and within environmental departments. We have already heard from the convener of the local government committee that the Royal Town Planning Institute has highlighted a 32 per cent reduction in planning department staff over the last 12 years, which has left planning departments critically short of the necessary resource at a time where the demand on their resource is growing exponentially. We also heard from Scottish Renewables that planning applications can take so long that by the time a decision is reached, the relevant turbine technology is obsolete. Surely that is a massive concern. These concerns were also recognised by the Climate Change Committee, which has called on the Scottish Government to ensure that adequate support is provided to allow for robust implementation of the framework, including the necessary guidance, training and resource to ensure that the necessary capacity and expertise is in place. So there are real concerns. There is consensus, which we've heard already, that the necessary planning capacity and resource is not available. One uh, recommendation the Net Zero Committee heard to address uh, the potential bottlenecks that planning may represent going forward is for the Scottish Government to classify planning resource as a STEM subject in order to prioritise the necessary skills in this area and attract more young people into what is and should be viewed as a very interesting career going forward with uh, massive opportunities given the policy uh, priorities in this area. Presiding officer, the Committee on Climate Change has also commented on the framework as being vision heavy and delivery light and went on to say it is unclear how the Scottish Government will ensure compliance with NPF4. The Net Zero Committee received consistent messages from stakeholders 
on this area on the importance of data collection, measurement and monitoring. Uh, we have heard already that the framework contains uh, a number of uh, references to mitigating, to reducing, to enhancing, but with little guidance on how these measures will be managed. So that, again, was an area we highlighted to the lead committee, the need for data collection, ma uh, measurement and mon monitoring uh, of these policy areas to ensure NPF4 is capable of being measured and managed on a meaningful basis. On the question of implementation and delivery, I understand, and the Minister can, can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, with the final draft of NPF 4, the Scottish Government will also lay a delivery plan before Parliament, and I hope the committees of this Parliament will have the opportunity to consider this uh, delivery plan as part of our scrutiny of the framework. Presiding officer, there is consensus across the Chamber on the, the vital importance of meeting Scotland's climate change emission reduction targets for 2030 and for 2045. These are quite rightly very ambitious targets. For these targets to be met, we will need to see an unparalleled level of private finance being invested across the board, including in the retrofitting of buildings and the decarbonisation of heat. A reminder that this will involve the retrofitting and decarbonisation of over a million domestic dwellings in Scotland and some 50,000 business premises by 2030, with an estimated cost of £36 billion. And just this morning, the Net Zero Committee heard evidence from private finance providers that this level of investment is available, but will only be forthcoming if government policy is clear, joined up and is supported with the capacity and resources to deliver on the ground. As things currently stand, much more work is required in order for the framework to meet these vital criteria. Presiding officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Lockhart. I now call on the Minister for up to eight minutes, Mr Arthur. Uh, Presiding officer, I am delighted that we are debating Scotland's fourth national planning framework today. As has been recognised uh, across the Chamber, this is a critically important strategy for Scotland's future. The draft NPF4 is, as has been recognised, a bold and ambitious plan. It has the potential to ensure that we build the developments and infrastructure we will need to help us to get to net zero and to tackle the nature crisis, and to do that whilst making our places better for people and for business. I welcome the very thoughtful and comprehensive report produced by the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, well informed by evidence presented by several of our committees, as we have just heard, and by a broad range of stakeholders. I wish to place on record that I am incredibly grateful for the time that this Parliament and our many stakeholders have put into the work done to prepare and scrutinise the draft NPF 4. I am confident that NPF 4 has captured people's imaginations, and we are seeing a renaissance in respect of this often undervalued profession and vital public service. There has never been a more important time for planners to help us address some of the challenges we are facing, from climate change to COVID recovery. I have been especially keen that we in this chamber collectively embrace this opportunity with enthusiasm to shape what we really need from Scotland's planning system in the challenging years ahead. And so I am hugely encouraged by the committee's report and by the positive way in which the Parliament and stakeholders have engaged with the debate on our future places. It seems clear to me that we all recognise the potential for planners to make a real and positive difference to our people, economy and places. I want to build on that consensus as we move towards finalising NPF4, so that in the future we can look back with pride and say that we work together to make the right choices for future generations. The committee report is very constructive, and I expect the debate to come will cover many of the issues it raises. So I won't try to cover every point in detail just now. However, I will highlight a number of areas. Firstly, there has been a lot of comment on the use of language, detailed wording, and the priority or weight to be given to different policies in NPF4. Through our public consultation, we have also received many detailed responses on this. I can assure the Parliament that we will work through the draft to ensure the final version is very clear on what is expected in planning decisions. We have recently received a detailed and helpful response from the UK Climate Change Committee 
and will give that careful consideration. There is no point in signalling commitment to, the, to net zero unless we can be confident the policies will lead to change on the ground. The committee makes an important point about community engagement, such a vital part of a planning system, hearing from local people to inform the choices we make for the future. The draft NPF 4 was prepared on the basis of wide and positive engagement, including with community organisations and interest groups. Some members may have seen the enthusiastic responses that people have shared on social media. We are doing a, a great deal of work to make the planning system more accessible, so that more people get involved in shaping their places. If I could ask the member if he would just allow me some time to progress. I would like to take interventions, I always do, but I have a lot to get through. I am limited for time, but I will try to pick up on any points in my concluding remarks. I was going to say that we are doing a great deal of work to make the planning system more accessible so that more people get involved in shaping their places. There is much more work to do to inspire and engage with people, whether through digital apps or more formally through local place plans. The committee has also raised important points around key policy areas, including 20-minute neighbourhoods, renewable energy, town centres and housing. The final draft that we will present to this parliament for approval will benefit from the many detailed responses that we have received on these and other topic areas. The pandemic has brought many challenges, but also shown us that we can live in a different, more sustainable way that supports our health, builds communities and promotes more neighbourly places. Planning also plays a crucial role in supporting good green jobs and building a wellbeing economy. This is not about choosing development over environment, but about place-based approaches which make good use of our assets by working with local people. I am conscious that some, for example in the renewables industry and house builders, have raised concerns about where our NPF 4 will help to deliver the developments we will need to get to net zero and support our future communities. I can assure the Parliament that we are considering these views very carefully, alongside wider responses, so we get the final version right. I want to support the delivery of development, but it must be of a good quality and in the right locations. The Committee has also commented on the importance of monitoring and evaluation. This is an important part of the planning system, reflected in the changes we are making to local development plans to be informed by thorough evidence reports. And it is also in how we are moving to a more outcomes-focused performance management system for planning. The NPF4 delivery programme will be a focal point for this monitoring. This isn't just a plan that will sit on a shelf, but a catalyst for place-based action, closely aligned with a range of other programmes and investment plans. I can assure the Parliament that this work is ongoing and that the revised draft NPF 4 will be accompanied by a delivery programme when I bring it to the Parliament later this year. Finally, I want to touch on resources and, in particular, the importance of planning authorities in taking NPF 4 forward. I give my commitment to revising the document so that is what is required of them is as clear as possible. Alongside this, I am committed to continuing to work with the high-level group to address performance and resources. Important, important work such as our collaboration to develop a pipeline of future planners will, I hope, mean that we can move forward with confidence that NPF 4 is deliverable over the longer term. Presiding officer, there are a wide range of views on NPF 4, but I would ask all members to bear in mind one important point throughout this debate. The vast majority of people who have engaged in the draft NPF 4 welcome its aims and ambition. Their comments focus on how we can best achieve those outcomes rather than asking for a change of direction. I want to build on that consensus so that the final version is a vision that we can all buy into, because NPF 4 brings with it a serious responsibility to do the right thing for Scotland. We must not find ourselves looking back and missed opportunities in years to come, thinking we could and should have done more. I am looking forward to hearing views from around the Chamber this afternoon 
I will listen carefully and respond to matters raised, and I will attempt to take interventions in my closing remarks. I apologise I have been unable to do so at this stage. And I will also continue to think long and hard how we can make sure Scotland's fourth national planning framework can be the best it can be before I bring it back to ask the Parliament to vote to approve it later in the year. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Miles Briggs um, for up to seven minutes, Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think I probably speak for all members of the Local Government Committee, in fact, all the committees across the Parliament, when I say that instead of counting sheep to get to sleep at night, I now count national planning frameworks. I'm sure the Minister is even worse, to be quite frank. But I would like to take genuinely this opportunity to pay tribute to all the individuals, organisations and businesses which have given evidence and submitted their views to the committee and the work of all the committees. I think this really does show the Parliament at its best when we work on um, a piece of work like this. And from the outset, I want to state that the key concerns outlined in the committee report around MPF4 very much stand. And I welcome what the Minister said today. I hope the Minister will take them seriously and use the period he now has uh, to try to fix the framework. Deputy President, officer, I wanted to use the time I have today to touch upon a few important issues and also bring to attention a few concerns um, we have on these benches with regards to MPF4 as it currently stands. Supporting the regeneration of our high streets is important and supporting our Scottish retail sector to recover from the pandemic is also critical. And there is cross-party support, I believe, for that town centre's first approach in our planning system. That's something uh, previous MPF or NPFs have looked towards achieving. Um, but I do think there are concerns with regards to um, the proposed moratorium of out-of-town retail developments, for example, that being too prescriptive and something we need to look towards uh, changing. And to look towards how the planning system currently looks at the merits of individual planning applications, as is currently the case. For example, garden centres um, and agricultural machinery retail, these are often on out outskirts of towns, and I think that's something we need to, to consider. And I agree with um, Gillian Martin in what she said with regards to one of the key themes which I think is missing from this, and that is with regards to um, the priority around active travel and creating, um, building healthier communities. The pandemic has demonstrated uh, the importance of access to safe green spaces for all of us um, to exercise, to undertake sport and for general uh, mental well-being. And I think that's something which we really need to capture within how we want to see our communities developed. During our time on the Health and Sport Committee, uh, the Minister and I heard of a number of opportunities to help improve community access, for example, to local facilities, especially schools um, for sports clubs and a number of uh, proposed reforms which were put to committees in the last session of this Parliament, um, which could make a real difference in making sure that new housing developments do have access to green space, as well as looking to uh, the legislation we have all supported around access legislation. And I welcome the Scottish Sports Association's um, points which they've put forward during this process, because I think there is um, potential to move forward with a number of reforms. I hope the Minister, um, following the cross-party group, which I know he attended, will look to take those forward. As Dean Lockhart stated, it is clear that there will be and there are a number of competing priorities and pressures uh, within MPF4. Um, as RSPB Scotland, the Wooden Trust and Friends of the Earth um, Scotland say in their briefings that the current uh, draft of MPF4 lacks the policy detail that planners, who are inevit inevitably will be taking this forward, um, will need to tackle the nature and climate crisis within uh, the planning system. And the delivery of energy, uh, renewable green energy targets is a key area of MPF4, which I believe sig needs significant improvement and something I've highlighted at committee. The re renewable sector have been clear that they have significant concerns with the current draft. And a number of companies have been calling for the draft, um, saying that the draft will be fatal to the renewable sector um, if we do not see changes put forward. It's telling that almost 20% of all correspondents which the committee received during our call for views on MPF4 actually came from renewable energy companies, highlighting their obvious and real concerns, I think, around um, the, the framework as it currently stands. Now, the sector have outlined uh, a number of options around drafting. I believe they've also put this to ministers, and I, I hope that that's something we will see ministers look at. Um, because it is concerning that, as it stands, we could see a less positive planning framework around renewable developments, um, as we saw in SPP in 2014. 
Finlay Carson stated um, that there has been indeed a lot of focus around wording um, during evidence sessions on all the committee and I think that's really important and I think for civil servants who are working on this that will be a challenge certainly the evidence we took at committee that was understandable but it is important that we do see uh, these changes and I know key sectors have provided these helpful suggestions on how outcomes can be achieved especially around policies around 3, 19, 28, 32 and whether or not um, the actual descriptive word used has to change um, ahead of um, what's been currently in the three previous um, frameworks. And I think that's something which will be difficult to look at, but I hope that's something the Minister's looking at um, seriously with his officials. And if we are serious about our net, tar net zero targets and the climate emergency, then the energy transition and creating the supply chain jobs, which Scotland has such a huge opportunity to deliver, is important, and that can be part of that change as well. Finally, um, in the time I have, and perhaps the most important issue, is around delivering the new homes, affordable homes, that we all want to see. And I noted in their submission uh, to the consultation that um, Homes for Scotland had hi highlighted in their documents a number of key uh, concerns that as it currently stands, we could see um, a reduced number of homes delivered, exacerbating the housing crisis. Now, I, I do, did want to see the framework include a housing crisis element. I think for many communities that is there and should have been um, looked at. And I hope so, making sure that the framework works to deliver the homes we all need to see is important. There is a lack of detail currently in the delivery strategy around financial interventions, which will help to deliver the homes Scotland wants to see. And as the convener um, highlighted in her opening remarks as well, the failure to address ongoing resourcing challenges within local authorities um, is often holding back many key planning decisions across many sectors. And that's something I hope we can see addressed. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, I welcome the constructive approach the Minister has taken to date, and he has a cross uh, Parliament. Today, I hope, is genuinely the start of a process where ministers can listen, to, can reach out across the chamber here, and we will work to make sure that the final national planning framework delivers the planning system Scotland needs to deliver the homes, the energy and the communities that we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Briggs. I now call on Mark Griffin for up to six minutes, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Like the, the convener and others, I want to thank the clerks for their assistance with the evidence sessions and producing the report that we are debating this afternoon. Uh, I am also thankful to everyone who gave, dev uh, gave evidence. I think scrutinising this uh, draft framework would have been much harder if not for the critical input of the practitioners and professionals we heard from. Uh, overwhelmingly, they said the framework is ambitious, but lacks the detail and clarity necessary to aid their scrutiny or understand their role delivering ambitions to reach net zero make Scotland a healthier country or to tackle our housing crisis over the next 10 years. The lack of a, a delivery and resource plan and monitor, monitoring framework has further hindered our ability to appreciate and scrutinise the plan uh, as well. And at its most basic level, there have been concerns about the process and language used. Heads of planning called for a longer consultation process to prevent appeals and court cases. The Net Zero Committee reported some respondents felt rushed to respond. And there remains, um, for instance, an unresolved debate around the use of should and must. We heard contributions from the Law Society and SURF that should may infer a level of discretion, while government uh, officials have disagreed with that interpretation. But though that might seem um, technical, uh, it is instructive because it allows us to ask then who this framework is for. Now, given it was planning professionals who told us they were struggling to understand the meaning and the intentions of some of the language in the framework, how then can we expect the public to be able to access and understand this document? For the framework to be effective, local communities, particularly those who are disadvantaged, must be empowered to contribute to decisions about developments in their area. And to do that, they need to understand it not be worn down by constant consultation and jargon. And in all likelihood, we believe that this draft framework will not deliver a public-led planning system, nor can the ambitions be achieved given the current state of planning departments. 
stripped back to their minimum in the face of £911 million pounds of real term cuts to local government since 2013. Like far from a renaissance of Scotland's planning system, our committee noted the almost universal concern about resources and talent, which will ultimately undermine the delivery of the ambitions within this framework. Now, digging into the, the policies, where there is the detail, the framework then asks more questions. The emphasis on addressing the climate emergency is incredibly welcome, but the, the question of how to deal with it and balance competing priorities was something we heard repeatedly. The, the Minister has agreed to consider how a presumption in favour of renewables could be more explicit, but policy 19, that most important for renewables and decarbonisation, is viewed as deficient. Solar Energy Scotland say it is internally contradictory. In Scotland, uh, Scottish Renewables say simply the proposed draft does not support an expansion of renewable energy. They offer a full redraft of the policy. Now, the need for a hierarchy of priorities was echoed by uh, RIES and Environment Link so that communities and planners know what the priorities are. But what I think um, sets off alarm bells for me, however, is the, the failure of the document to help tackle our housing crisis. Now, as SFHA point out, housing to 2040 is barely aligned. But we heard the minimum housing numbers risk becoming a de facto target for low house building. Homes for Scotland say the minimum housing numbers serve no beneficial purpose, and worse still, that we could be planning for decline. Two councils questioned the numbers they are given and the process altogether, while Taylor Wimpey advised me that the policies contained within the framework could make it difficult to progress proposals to delivery on the ground. The, the Minister's de desire to focus on great places rather than numbers, I feel, will not do anything to support the most disadvantaged at the sharp end of the housing crisis. And I would add, urge him to, to work instead across all government to set an all-tenure um, housing target within the revised document that he brings to Parliament um, for approval. I think this framework is undoubtedly a, a draft, but much more of a draft than a, um, I fear the Minister and his official realised and needs more than just a, a simple brushing up ahead of, ahead of parliamentary uh, approval. As the consultation closed, the Housing and Place Delivery Forum, including Academics, Homes for Scotland, Alacho, SFHA and the Chartered Institute for Housing, wrote to him asking that the process is paused so clear shortcomings can be addressed and the spatial framework radically rethought to align with existing governance and delivery structures. Now, President Officer, that is a serious intervention. I think it sums up where we are. I would ask the Minister to respond to that urgent um, call in the debate today and um, in his response to the Committee's report to substantively revise the framework so planners can then match the ambitions, the clear ambitions within PF4 with clarity, practical action and delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, Mr Griffin. I now call on Beatrice Wishart for up to six minutes. Uh, Ms Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The National Planning Framework is an important part of Scotland's future. Like others, I too have received many briefings and representations from stakeholders across Scotland in preparation for this debate. To quote RSPB Scotland, the current draft of NPF4 lacks the policy detail that planners, developers and communities need to tackle the nature and climate crisis through Scotland's planning system. The RSPB go on to say they share the Committee's view that Parliament needs more time for scrutiny and believes that members must ask for clear mechanisms within NPF4 for delivering biodiversity enhancement. I would like to echo this sentiment for more scrutiny and greater time to flesh out the detail. Presiding Officer, I would like to start by talking about town planning and the impact it can have on lives and say a little about rural and island areas too. Last month, my Liberal Democrat colleague in Westminster, Christine Jardin MP, brought forward a private member's bill, the Planning Women's Safety Bill. Women need a voice in planning processes to bring necessary pers perspectives 
to give women the foundations for more agency and to feel less vulnerable in their daily lives. But town planning has most often been from men's perspective. Designing spaces without a gender bias is crucial if we are to have well-lit and open areas, avoiding narrow, poorly lit, twisting alleyways, which are not routes that conjure up safety, security and encourage passage. It's about enabling women to plan and go about their lives with safety and security. Women should be confident in knowing that their concerns have been considered in new developments so that they can feel, feel safer in living their lives. And given what's been said before about the lack of planners generally, I think there's a job of work to be done in encouraging more people into planning, especially women. The Scottish Sports Association also highlighted the ability of planning decisions to enhance lives in their response to the consultation. Planning done in the right way can increase mental health and active travel, thereby making a happier population. Different planning ideas could, for example, encourage more learners to use active travel methods to get to school, allowing for further access to nature, to physical activity and to extracurricular activities where rigid bus timetables can limit travel home. Liberal Democrats believe that decisions should be made as close to the people they will affect as possible, and that is why we believe in empowering local communities. It's one of the reasons my colleagues voted against the planning bill in the last Parliament, as it did not address the voices of local communities adequately enough throughout the new planning process. Scotland has a housing crisis, and my own constituency is not immune from this situation either. To address this, we must look at building more homes, but we must look at building the right homes in the right places. The NPF4 is important for our rural and island communities. A Scottish Liberal Democrat campaigning led to a rural and islands housing fund being established to increase the supply of affordable housing in these communities through renovation and new builds. And we would like to see an extension and expansion of the Rural Housing Fund and the Islands Housing Fund and reducing the barriers for communities to access them. We'd also like to see a requirement for public bodies to consult with rural communities and island communities and as well to make sure that Scottish legislation is rural proof as well as island proof. In February, in a session of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, I quizzed the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands on fuel poverty in rural and island communities, the areas often most greatly impacted, asking if the NPF4 should give more prominence to the issue. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is our opportunity to make the right choices for the future. More scrutiny and greater time to flesh out the detail would be a good next step. Getting this right now will be worth it for all of us, for the communities we represent in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wishart. And we now move to the open debate. And I call Graeme Day to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, a process such as parliamentary consideration of the draft MPF4 asks one fundamental thing of those charged with conducting it, then in considering the government's proposals and any contrary viewpoints, we do so under merit, setting uh, aside our own instinctive positions and recognising that what we are, in essence, being asked to do is reach conclusions based on opinions or interpretations, sometimes clouded by predictable underlying, perhaps understandable, biases. In essence, committees have to sift through claim and counterclaim, uh, often each with their own merits, in order to appoint an appropriate and balanced way forward. So I pay tribute to the Local Government Committee, which I served on for a small part of its consideration of MPF4, for uh, highlighting some of the genuine key issues uh, with the draft uh, and, uh, and for making some reasonable asks to the Government. And based on the contributions from other relevant conveners today, I would extend that praise to the other committees. In the uh, brief time available to me today, I want to focus on just a few of the issues. Uh, President Officer, the fact that at the heart of some of the legitimate criticism of the framework is an ask around greater government direction, certainly as a long-serving member of this parliament, causes me a wry smile. Because all too often central government is criticised for being too prescriptive, too directive in its approach. We are told there should be greater flexibility afforded local government when it comes to implementation of policies and plans. And yet here, as the report highlights, there is a plea from the people whose job it will be to bring aspects of MPF4 to life at a local level 
uh, for greater clarity around prioritisations and the true meanings of concepts, along with the use of clearer and more decisive language. Now, to be fair, around prioritisation, th this is perhaps a legitimate ask. The appeal from uh, Christina Granger of the Royal Incorporation of Architects for a hierarchy of matters which should be taken into account uh, into consideration strikes me as having quite a degree of justification. At the very least, planners need some broad guidance. Then there is the issue of terms such as community wealth building and 20-minute neighbourhoods and what they actually mean, especially in the latter instance in rural settings. The committee heard also of concerns around the definition of out-of-town locations. Clarity of a sort here is needed, not only for planners and developers, but frankly the wider public, some of whom will, let us face it, wonder what on earth community wealth being, uh, building actually means. Then there is the matter, as we have heard, around the choice and meaning of the language used, the use of the word should rather than must being uh, deployed, um, and of course the view of the Law Society that using should in relation to policies 5 to 35 of the MPP offers insufficient clarity on whether the policy must be complied with. Um, as a number of colleagues uh, have noted, Presiding Officer, um, there is also the issue about capacity and the ability of planning departments to deliver uh, on MPF uh, 4. It was quite sobering to learn that resources at the disposal of planning departments had suffered a 42 per cent real terms cut since 2009, meaning that they are struggling to meet current duties and obligations, let alone what MPF 4 will generate. Uh, and in addition to the resourcing issue, we heard about the need for an estimated 700 new planners over the next 10 to 15 years, and we were told a change in culture is needed. Um, COSLA are advocating for full cost recovery in order to properly fund planning departments, including in terms of reskilling existing staff. They probably have a case, President Officer, but personally, I would want some firm assurance that any sums generated by full cost recovery were effectively ring-fenced for planning departments and not left at risk of hiving off, because otherwise delivery of MPF 4 would without doubt be at risk. I will conclude by expressing my support for the ask of the Local Government Committee that it is afforded an opportunity, a proper opportunity, to consider the finalised version of MPF 4. President Officer. Thank you. I now call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to take part in this debate, and I um, in some ways feel responsible uh, for this debate taking place, uh, because I was uh, on the committee, uh, the old uh, Local Government Committee, that dealt with the planning bill uh, when it was going through, and it was at my insistence, in fact, I think it was my amendment uh, that got the ability for Parliament to vote uh, on the MPF4 uh, in, into that bill and subsequently the Act. So here we are. Um, what we didn't have uh, was the ability to amend the, uh, the, the draft, um, and I think from what we've heard so far, that would be a good thing. Uh, we seem to have a, a listening minister in post, so perhaps uh, as we move on in this process, he might want to consider uh, some kind of ability for uh, committees to be able to change things, improve things, because improvement from what we've heard already is definitely needed. We've heard the word clarity used time and time again. Um, Graham Day, the, the previous speaker, um, he, he spoke about uh, you, know, you know, woolly phrases that crop up throughout this document, uh, and as, a, as, as two former journalists, uh, that grates, uh, because when you use phrases like you know, community engagement and 20-minute neighbourhoods, you have to ask, what on earth does that mean? Um, this, um, at the moment, I'm afraid, is a typical planning document where you can make any argument fit any circumstance. Um, it may take time, but it does need to be rewritten. And I think Ariane Burgess, um, although she might not realise it, actually agrees with that point. Um, we need to have fewer get-out clauses in, in, in this. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, the community of Calder Bank in North Lanarkshire, which I represent as a regional member, has had uh, the threat of a large planning development hanging over it for some years now. 
uh, and it includes a, a large area of ancient woodland, uh, uh, an area rich in heritage. Now, I'm, what I'm looking at in the MPF 4 is would that protect that area of ancient woodland? And currently, the answer is no. Now, I'm a firm supporter and defender of green spaces, and partic particularly woods. So let's have a look at what, what it says about woodlands. It says, existing woodlands should be protected wherever possible. Wherever possible. That's the get-out clause. Policy 34 on trees, woodland and forestry says, local development plans should identify and protect existing woodland and potential for its enhancement or expansion Development proposals should not be supported where they would result in any loss of ancient woodlands, ancient and veteran trees, or adverse impact on their ecological condition. Well, what is an ancient woodland? How do we tackle the old trick of chopping down trees, saying they're past their best? There is never any enforcement action, even if the tree is protected. It also says development proposals should not be supported where they would result in, quotes, fragmenting or severing woodland habitats unless mitigation measures are identified and implemented. That's another get-out clause. There are a whole series of them. So throughout this document, the, there is woolly language. It needs to be tightened up. And I would just uh, urge the minister to get people round the table. I think he wants to do that um, so that we can get to a point where everyone can agree on a document that actually makes some sense and delivers. Thank you. Uh, I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate this afternoon. Can I also thank the clerks and other members of the committee uh, this afternoon? Can I also refer uh, members to managers of interest? I'm a seven councillor on East Lothian Council, at least for the next two weeks. Uh, I've been a sitting councillor in East Lothian for the past 15 years. Planning is fundamental to the economic well-being of an area. It's fundamental to the biodiversity of an area, and it's fundamental in how we tackle a climate challenge we all face. I want to focus on two key areas this afternoon, and that's in housing and renewable energy. If we are to meet the 110,000 affordable housing target by 2032, we need as much clarity around some key strategies. In achieving these targets, we need to maximise deliverability, and that's key word deliverability of homes of all tenures aligned with the stated aims and ambitions of the Scottish Government. The committee report mentions that we need to ensure there is compatibility, and this has been mentioned and followed through on the minimum all tenure housing land requirement figures and on the housing needs demand assessment. So I'm going to use Matler and Honda going forward rather than and, and where, and also key fundamentally to the housing 2040 strategy. Homes for Scotland in the response to NPA 4 stated that the 10 year Matler figures as pretended by each local authority and Scottish Government need to be robustly challenged. Local authorities should be able to justify the minimum housing number to ensure that the minimum standard is set at the appropriate level. Some local authorities have proposed a matter figure that falls below their previous 10-year completions level. This is a criti uh, critical consideration at this time, given the role that NPF4 will play as a core part of Scotland's suite of next-generation local development plans. The current Honda process also needs to be refreshed as soon as possible to identify the full range of housing needs across the country, with many households at the moment being excluded. We need to ensure that housing with care requirements, along with student housing numbers, are reflected accurately. NPF 4 also sets out higher the bar than existed previously regarding the allocation of sites for residential development. The draft NPF 4 outlines that sites should now be deliverable. We need to ensure key stakeholders work closely in this regard. Discussions around resource also to achieve this are also key. We heard that before from other members. Planning fees have just increased on the 1st of April this year, and we need to ensure there is a clear strategy on the improvement of planning performance in line with that. In developing sites, there are two other key areas I want to mention, and again it has been mentioned before. We need to ensure that active transport considerations are front and centre of any proposal, and this needs co-production and design with local communities. Walking, cycling, horse riding and bus routes need to be in place. The other consideration is around about ensuring sufficient green space and infrastructure to support development of sports facilities. Many new developments see lots of children move into the areas. We need to ensure sports provision has ability to grow. The second key area is renewables. Scotland has rightly recognised the emergency facing our climate. We have an ambitious net zero target. To realise a Scotland powered by renewable energy, we must achieve a net zero planning system. 
the NPF4 planning reforms provide a key opportunity to deliver this ambition. The sector already supports 22,500 jobs and economic input of £5.2 billion a year. The following priorities should be get considered to achieve this. Climate change and nature recovery should become the golden thread running through the entire NPF4. We need to ensure that there is clear guidance now the planning balance should change to ensure addressing climate change and supporting nature recovery as the guiding primary principles in all plans and all decisions. And we need to ensure that NPF4 delivers levels of renewable energy development needed to achieve net zero. NPF4 should be an enabling tool for facilitating the ambitions set by the Scottish Government. It should also ensure it is designed to facilitate renewable energy deployment. Officer, in conclusion, NPF4 is one of the most important policy decisions we will take in this parliamentary session. Local Government House and Planning Committee will continue its work to maximise the opportunity this brings. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Paul Sweeney to be followed by Emma Harper. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been interesting to listen to the contributions of colleagues, and I share many of the concerns raised by the committee about the inadequacies of the current national planning framework. Um, certainly, it's a great tradition in Scotland, uh, where, born of the Scottish Enlightenment, urban planning was actually devised in the first instance in Scotland, and we have a great tradition of it. Indeed, the city of Glasgow itself was largely designed by the city architect John Carrick and laid out from the 1870s under the City Improvement Trust which set the standards of how tenement buildings might look, the datum lines of streets, how wide streets would be, the sanitary conditions of the city's public buildings. And that has largely given rise to the, the character, the outstanding historic character of the city of Glasgow, despite many ill-advised post-war planning decisions that the city has suffered. Um, and unfortunately, over the past 20 to 30 years, certainly, the previously accepted standardised design of communities, high density, sustainable, scalable, in cities like Glasgow has been eroded and replaced by a patchwork, laissez-faire approach, where developers are largely given free reign to build whatever they see fit. So a key omission of the National Planning Framework is the need for rigorous and clearly prescribed urban design codes. And that is something we really need to see more rigorously attempted in this, this National Planning Framework. Attempts have been made to reinstate a design code with work undertaken by heritage architects like Collective Architecture and Dress for the Weather, but as of yet, they have failed to be adopted in Glasgow and in Scotland more widely, much to the detriment of the city itself. It also provides a huge opportunity to address the climate emergency. For example, if there were to be a standardised design code for Glasgow, it would allow for the creation of standard designs for products like air source heat pumps and how they would be installed in these buildings. Uh, instead, I've had constituents contact me frustrated that their planning applications to install such devices is being rejected by Glasgow City's uh, planning department rather than encouraged and adopted in a, con a constructive way. I think that is certainly very short-sighted and counterproductive in the context of a twin climate and cost of living crisis, and I hope that can be rectified swiftly through the NPF4 process. We also need to look at our city's beauty and how the impacts on people's well-being and sense of self-esteem in communities, as Harry Burns has often talked about, the urban environment reflects people's psychological sense of well-being, and that is often given scant regard in the planning process. Look at things as simple as how beautiful shop fronts look. We have seen examples of outstanding best practice in Scotland, where traditional shop front reinstatement programmes have really dramatically lifted and improved the condition of high streets, yet they are seen as an isolated intervention, rather than it being the norm that is formalised in planning legislation. That is something we need to learn from more rigorously and adopt it as part of a proper urban design code. And I hope that NPF4 will look at where best practice is really working well and scale up as the baseline for how Scotland should adopt its policy rather than it simply being a flash in the pan. Work is underway in areas like Saracen Street and Postal Park in the north of Glasgow, the Postal Park Business Improvement District, working with local businesses to encourage these kind of interventions, and they are proving to be amazingly dramatically successful. I think these are the things we need to seriously see developed as part of MPF4 rather than vague uh, promises and vague visions. And we also need to look at sustainability. In Glasgow, for example, there are over 76,000 pre-1919 tenements dating back to the pre-1920 period. There's a maintenance crunch coming in Glasgow, where over 60 per cent of these buildings are in need of urgent repairs, estimated to be in excess of £3 billion. We are not addressing this with nearly the sense of urgency that is required, and MPF4 isn't addressing it. We only need to look at recent crises, such as that faced by the Trinity Towers in Park Circus, where the owners are faced with a £3 million repair bill, which is potentially going to make them bankrupt. 
So these are just two examples where we need to seriously see change and more rigorous intervention. The new MPF4 is the best opportunity we've had in decades to reinvigorate our great cities and towns, stitching them back together and making them more sustainable, attractive places to live. I hope that we're all able to work together to achieve that aim. Thank you. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Harper. Thanks, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I responded to the NPF4 consultation and I appreciate colleagues' comments so far in the Chamber. And I want to focus my comments on two specific issues which this draft framework will impact. One is vacant, derelict and abandoned sites, and the other one is permitted development rights. President Officer, Scotland has almost 11,000 hectares of vacant and derelict sites, equivalent to 20,556 football pitches, and people on average live within 500 metres of a derelict site. And according to the Scottish Land Commission, if a person lives in an SIMD area, they are more likely to live within 250 metres of a derelict site. Evidence we took at Health Committee affirmed that these sites negatively affect community mental health and well-being. People feel less safe. People use the words blight and eyesore. People take less pride in their, their own home place when living beside derelict, decaying or dilapidated eyesore. And the Scottish Land Commission affirmed this in their work. I have proactively sought to engage and support communities to see timely action taken to address these sites across Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. This includes the former Interfloor factory in Dumfries, George Hotel in Stranraer, Central Hotel in Annan, and Darstein Mill and N Peel Building in Hoyk, which I visited yesterday. However, as the draft framework and indeed the Scottish Land Commission have pointed out, addressing these buildings currently presents many challenges to communities and local authorities. And I welcome that the spatial principles for Scotland described in the report, the spatial principles for Scotland 2045, they seek, it seeks to limit urban expansion into greenfield sites and instead will incentivise the reuse of brownfield sites for redevelopment. However, as noted by COSLA, there exists additional financial constraints around utilising abandoned sites in this way, and it is often extremely costly for developers and local authorities to address them. For example, the former Marksalton High School in Dumfries caused about it cost about a quarter of a million pounds to demolish before the site can even be redeveloped. I would like assurance from the Minister that the Government will proactively work with local authorities and developers to ensure that they are accessing vacant and derelict land funds and that the public funding will continue to be made available to rede redevelop brownfield sites, eyesore sites, which blight our communities. Presiding officer, my second point today, I have been involved in the community in Estelle Muir, the Sami Ling Buddhist Monastery and with the Upper Tiwi at Dale and Borthwick Water Community Council. They are all concerned over the dynamic and target shooting act activity in the area where high velocity weapons of up to 50 calibre are being fired. These powerful weapons, which require skill and accuracy, they shoot ammunition up to two mile distance and are being used to close, close by the Roman and Reavers walkways, Craig Hope Education Centre on the border side of the, of the, the border way and the Southern Upland Way. So I share the community's concerns over the safety and the reported high decibel level of the shooting. The shooting activity is operating using a law loophole and Class 15 of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order 1992 Permitted Development Rights allow for a temporary use of land for a different use to its lawful use up to 28 days in a calendar year. The only exemptions are for caravan sites or an open air market. So I agree with the community that this is wrong and that shooting activity, particularly with such high-powered weapons and ammunition, should be subject to robust major planning, which allows local voices to be heard. I would like to see that in the final NPF4 framework. So I thank the Minister for his engagement so far in this matter. But I do, or I would like to ask the Minister for a commitment that NPF4 will ensure that any proposal for shooting ranges and activity like shooting be subject to a robust major planning application. Finally, President Officer, I reiterate my two asks. It is just focus on tackling vacant, derelict and abandoned sites and looking at closing the shooting activity loophole in the permitted development rights. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I now call uh, Mark Ruskell to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. Ruskell. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I welcome this fourth national planning framework? And I think, in particular, the recognition of the climate emergency for the first time as an overarching objective is really welcome because, of course, what we plan for today must deliver a just transition tomorrow rather than locking us into a polluting economy for decades to come. But like previous planning frameworks, this NPF does not sit in isolation. What is agreed in the final version of the Strategic Transport Projects Review and the Energy Strategy will also be very key. While at the local level, councils will have work to do to translate some of the fresh thinking in this NPF into their own local development plans. And 20-minute neighbourhoods are a case in point here because they should set a new standard for localisation where travel is minimised, where people can meet more of their everyday needs locally and where our high streets are regenerated. They should be a benchmark for new developments, but of course we're already seeing major housing growth areas such as in Schoon being built with minimal upfront investment in essential services, building car dependency in from day one. And we're still seeing multi-million pound proposals for car dependent outer town retail centres being approved by many local councils like the controversial ASDA development in Stirling. Now, this has to change. 20-minute neighbourhoods must mark the start of relocalisation, driven by the needs of communities, rather than the whim of developers. Now, Parliament has also heard uh, important evidence on nature restoration. I think Graeme Simpson highlighted some of the woolly words that exist around woodlands. But the, the draft acknowledges the, the nature emergency, that's right, but it must now follow through, making sure that developments deliver net positive benefits for nature, and also that nature networks are given the status in planning that they actually need as a major part of our national infrastructure. The environmental NGOs have provided, I think, important feedback. I know the Minister's listening. I hope he will now act on that feedback from the NGOs. Now, Presiding Officer, I'm, I'm very proud that this Parliament, uh, even with its limited devolved powers, has been able to put in place a ban on new nuclear power stations and fracking through the planning framework. Scotland is still living through a damaging and costly legacy from coal and nuclear power that communities and energy consumers will pay for generations to come. So, you know, the Tories and Labour need to come clean as to where they would put new nuclear power stations and waste dumps in Scotland because as I read it in the National Planning Framework there is no place for either in NPF4 and I would say to the Tories as well which communities from Larbert to Cannonby would see fracking licenses resurrected and planning applications supported by Tory councillors because we cannot afford any more costly distractions like fracking and nuclear that will take years to implement but offer nothing to people who are having to choose today between heating and eating. Let's face it, Scotland has won the jackpot of clean renewable resources, and with technology costs continuing to plummet, now is the time to double down on that natural advantage and deliver new wind and solar farms. And this is technology that's developed rapidly. It's time that the planning system caught up. There will always be constraints on where wind farms can go but we can maximise extensions, repower existing wind farms, while developing new sites that have lingered in the planning system for years. This draft NPF does not yet deliver the changes that are needed if we're to double the capacity of onshore wind and increase ambition on solar. But, presiding officer, I look forward to the minister reflecting on the recommendations made across parliament so Scotland can power ahead in tackling both the climate and nature emergencies while delivering a just transition that is both prosperous and fair. Thank you. I now call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Megan Gallagher. Up to four minutes, please, Mr McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I want to uh, thank the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee for bringing this, uh, this uh, issue forward for debate. I'm not a member of this committee, but was keen to participate to raise some issues of importance to my constituents. There are some key tenants that I believe should be the foundation of this framework, and these are making provisions for a nature-positive Scotland and a healthy, active Scotland. And I fully welcome the NPF4, as we need a long-term plan, and I agree that any development plans must have em emission assessments, physical activity assessments, and green space provisions enshrined into their planning. 
Investing in a healthy, active Scotland is something that we will have innumerable benefits and should be encouraged by all playing fields, community centres and investment in schools and other facilities for other grassroots-level sports for local communities is something that will benefit communities and all ages. The pandemic and lockdowns have also surely demonstrated the need for everyone to have access to good quality local green and blue spaces, and reinforces, for example, the vital work in an area such as Coat Bridge, the Monkland Canal, and making it accessible as possible for people. And I want to put on record my thanks to the Friends of Monkland Canal Group, Scottish Canals and Sustrans for their recent work and investment. And, President Officer, I do actually hope to bring a member's debate on this very issue to the Chamber soon. I will now spend the remainder of my time speaking about some local issues that do have a national bearing with the planning system that have been brought to my attention in my time as MSP. As a brief bit of context for the Chamber, my constituency of Coatbridge and Chryston is home to the densely urban town of Coatbridge, which is flanked by similar post-industrial towns. However, the north of my constituency, approximately one third of it, is comprised of several small towns and villages. These include Steps, Muirhead, Chryston, Moodyspun, Glenboig and Gartcosh, and together they are referred to as the Northern Corridor. The requirement of a nature-positive and healthy active Scotland applies to those currently living in communities like the Northern, Northern Corridor. This area has seen huge increase in development and planning in recent years, and many of my constituents feel this has come at the cost of a nature-positive and healthy active locality. These communities are brought together ably through the Northern Corridor Community Forum, and I want to put on record my thanks to all those who have worked too hard to ensure the forum is a success. I can't possibly name everyone, but in particular current office bearers Alice Morton, Isabel Kelly and Carol Henderson. Throughout the Northern Corridor, every one of these very unique and often also post-industrial small communities has witnessed extensive development in recent years with a seemingly endless list of planning applications. It is understandable that developers want to build in these areas, and my communities are not against house building. But the sheer scale of these developments have brought with it a huge loss of asset in terms of green space, woodland and wider natural environment, transport difficulties and rapidly increasing populations have left schools alarmingly over capacity and health services struggling to cope with demand, points that have been made by other speakers earlier. These are real issues and generally the Northern Corridor Community Forum do not feel that their voices are being heard and that the North Lanarkshire Council Local Development Plan is not taking into account the specific needs of these village areas. Thinking back to 2019, I spoke in support of petition PE 1748, lodged by the aforementioned Isabel Kelly, which looked at planning policy for small communities in Scotland. The crux of the petition was that any future planning policy should undertake a full audit of community assets and infrastructure before development takes place, and that planning policy listens to local communities about high-value asset, um, high assets that might be jeopardised. And I think this is a reasonable request, and the NPF4 must acknowledge that the desires and concerns of for existing communities are necessary for inclusion in planning policy also. We can't get away from the fact that some people in local communities, such as those in the Northern Corridor, do feel ignored when it comes to planning policy. The Minister, I, I know I've had a lot of correspondence with the Minister on this issue, and I want to thank him for all the, um, the, the feedback that he's given me and the responses to those. But in summing up, I would be grateful if two points can be addressed. Firstly, I am aware that the Minister is in the process of approving the adoption of the North Lanarkshire LDP. Can I ask how you will ensure that concerns of my constituents are taken into account in this and following this process, how he thinks it would be best for the Government to engage directly on a face-to-face -face basis with the Forum? And secondly, can the Minister advise how best, to, how best it would be to achieve Briefly, Mr. An McGregor, you're over your time. or inquiry in, uh, facing, uh, of issues facing the Northern Corridor area in North Lanarkshire? And I will close there, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Megan Gallagher to be followed by Faisal Treasury. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. National Planning Framework 4 formed a large part of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee's work over the last few months, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate. As many members have outlined, MPF 4 sets out where development and infrastructure are required throughout the whole of Scotland. There are, of course, merits in undertaking this piece of work, and I believe the intentions are genuine. However, as with every piece of legislation, MPF 4 does not come without its challenges. And this was certainly my experience as a committee member who participated in formal evidence sessions on the framework alongside stakeholder engagement events out with the committee structure. And at times I was rather frustrated with the process. 
Although I support some of the ambitions contained within National Planning Framework 4, I do not believe the Scottish Government has understood the scale of the work involved in implementing the framework. This was certainly the view expressed by key stakeholders during our evidence sessions. For example, many stakeholders outlined that framework lacks clarity. Dr Caroline Brown, Professor of Infrastructure at Heriot Watt University, raised concerns about clarity within the MPF 4 document. She explained that elements of MPF 4 need to be fleshed out to provide clarity, particularly in a system that is struggling for resources. And the lack of resource, which has been mentioned by many members so far, is a point that I would like to raise during my short contribution this afternoon. Councils, and I will declare an interest presiding officer as I am until the 5th of May, a serving councillor in North Lanarkshire Council, will need to be better funded if MPF 4 is to be a success. As we do know, council funding has been cut over the last decade, and this has had a considerable impact on planning decisions amongst other service areas and local authorities. And as we know as well, local authorities are best placed to implement planning decisions in their communities. However, they have been starved of the ambition to make changes due to the lack of fair funding. MPF 4 could allow for greater flexibility in local government planning policy. I believe that this would lead to better decisions that would improve our diverse and unique communities throughout Scotland. Last week, I visited Barnes Hall and Motherwell within my region um, with a local RSBP team. And for an urbanised area, it is fantastic to have such a beautiful nature reserve on your doorstep. One of the many issues we discussed during our walk around the reserve was increasing the resilience of biodiversity, helping to tackle climate change and directing investment towards nature and creating better spaces for people and nature to cohabit. This left me wondering why plans relating to the creation of a nature network was not included in MPF 4 and if this is an area that should be explored further within the final draft. Presiding officer, four minutes is not a long time to reflect on weeks of evidence and the content within an MPF 4 document. But one other area I would like to mention before I draw my remarks to a close relates to 20-minute neighbourhoods. This was one of the many areas I focused on when asking questions during committee and more work is needed to define a 20-minute neighbourhood and what this would mean, particularly for our rural areas. We have a lack of transport infrastructure in our rural areas and this would need to be significantly improved for a 20-minute neighbourhood to even be considered. I feel that this idea is more intended for urban areas, but we can't cut off our rural areas that are in desperate need of investment. I do believe that this specific area needs expanded, and I would be grateful to the Minister if he could reflect and again outline how rural parts of Scotland could implement 20-minute neighbourhoods, especially in relation to building local circular economies. To conclude, Presiding Officer, MPF 4 has its merits, but we need more clarity over its deliverability. My worry is that MPF 4 will overpromise and underdeliver for communities who need development and infrastructure. My other concern is that by the lack of clarity contained within the current document, this will be open to interpretation and there will be no way to record or monitor progress. Will we be able to, to find out if any lessons have been learned from previous national frameworks and how will success be monitored moving forward? Finally, I would like to see a national planning framework that gives our local authorities more autonomy to make the best possible decisions for their area. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Alistair Allen. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I must firstly commend the committee and its members on their hard work producing this report. It provides a good overview of the benefits and problems of the draft planning framework. This framework is going to set the stage for Scotland's development in the coming years. As a nation committed to sustainability, biodiversity and tackling the climate crisis, and the committee clearly recognises the importance of getting this right. This is a part of why um, I and my colleagues on these benches find the lack of details in the framework to be particularly concerning. Planning authorities across Scotland must have clarity, both in terms of their priorities and the definition of the areas they are to prioritise if the NPF4 is to be successful. This clarity is particularly important because of the emphasis the Scottish Government is putting on the climate emergency. We, of course, welcome this emphasis. 
but the authorities who will be operating under, under this framework must have confidence that they are following it as it was intended. Any lack of clarity defeats the point of having national planning framework in the first place and invites piecemeal implementation across local authorities. We must also ensure that people have confidence in the planning system and the role of local development plans. I've heard from within the Ludian region that the Scottish Government have not provided robust interim guidance on the issues of effective land supply. Report, reporters have also been given requirements which have led to them approving speculation sites that do not fit with the local development plans. How in this circumstance are local populations and local authorities to be brought along with the planning and development process? Any national framework must be a collaborative process that brings local population and local authorities along rather than alienating them. Also, if we are to ensure a truly national planning framework, we must have a commitment from the Scottish Government to properly funded planning department. After years of real terms cuts to local authorities, we have a situation where planning departments have been cut back to their bare minimum. How do we expect this framework to work at a national level when its implementation will depend on how or indeed if? local authorities across Scotland have been able to shield their planning departments from nearly a decade of cuts. It is crucial that we get these questions right now, rather than chasing solution to them years down the line and risking yet more waste of time and resources pursuing goals that are not clearly set out. I therefore join with my colleagues in calling for a pause to this process so that these points can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Alistair Allen, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to four minutes, please, Dr Allen. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, members have, I believe, already seen and indeed heard in this debate evidence that MPF4 marks a real turning point in Scotland's planning system, not least because that system now allows a key role for this Parliament. The draft of the fourth national planning framework laid before Parliament last November has been subject to extensive scrutiny and interest both here and in wider society, as a number of speakers have reflected on. The draft does represent a change in direction in how we think of the places we live in in Scotland. It is grounded, I hope, in an attempt to ensure that our planning system can live up to the aspirations of COP and recover economically from COVID as well as simply make our communities more resilient and more pleasant places to work, and above all, perhaps, places it is important to see with a sense of distinctive place. However, I think we all recognise that for those aspirations to be realised, strong leadership will certainly be needed in this place and locally. Compared to its predecessors, NPDF 4 is likely to be shaped to a greater extent by this Parliament following the Planning Scotland Act 2019. So the importance of meeting the needs of communities is recognised in the longer 120-day period of scrutiny and in the requirement for the draft NPF to be approved by a resolution of this Parliament before it can be adopted by Government. The draft has been scrutinised, as others have commented on, by four committees of this Parliament. The Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth has in turn reacted to this process, and the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee's report, uh, I quote, welcomes the NPF4 and its ambition. But one item I wanted to focus on briefly is uh, spatial strategy and the place that uh, uh, the, uh, is given to that, and how this Parliament will need to shape that as a concept. I think particularly of spatial strategy as it applies in rural areas where, as others have mentioned, the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods uh, will need to be imagined slightly differently uh, for obvious reasons. 
We will need to develop these concepts as we go in order to counteract uh, uh, and not contribute towards uh, the tendencies towards the centralisation of population in a few small number of rural centres uh, away from our more fragile communities uh, that has happened over the last few decades. So it is good to see the focus which NPDF4 puts on rural proofing planning goals in rural areas. The draft NPF4 sets out important proposals for the resettlement of previously inhabited areas. It will also enable new homes in rural communities with planning policies that are more proactive and directive in shaping existing places and creating new ones. In particular, we will have to put housing needs at the heart of what we understand by good rural planning. Literally everywhere I go in my island constituency, whatever the meeting is about, people express to me their anxieties about the need for affordable housing, both to buy and to rent. We need to overcome outmoded models of planning social housing that create a catch-22 where no houses are built in some rural areas, uh, where there is no record of demand. There is, of course, often no record of demand, simply because there are virtually no rented houses for which anyone might apply. So on that note, Presiding Officer, I hope that both in rural and urban Scotland alike, uh, we can work together as a parliament to ensure that NPF4 can enable the investment and development that Scotland will need in the coming decades, creating communities where people can prosper and where, crucially, they can actually afford to live. Thank you. And we will now move to closing speeches. And I call on Alex Riley to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Riley. Thank you, President Officer. Tom Arthur said earlier in speaking that, in terms of MPF4, the majority of consultants, the majority of people who have come back, welcome the aims. And of that, I have absolutely no doubt. But I do agree with the committee that there is a lack of detail contained within the draft document and the absence of a clear delivery plan backed up by financial commitments and an effective monitoring process leaves more questions than it does give answers, and that needs to be addressed. Mr Swisher, I think, said that, that when the planning bill last came to this parliament, uh, she and her party voted against it. I certainly voted against it, and so did the Labour Party, because despite the rhetoric about wanting to engage communities, wanting to involve communities, giving communities far more say, the reality is that that planning bill denied people the same rights, denied communities the same rights as developers. And surely it cannot be right. I know the SNP colleagues voted with the Tories against the amendments to give equal rights to, to communities and individuals. But it cannot be right that developers have such control and such power over communities, over elected councillors, over democratically elected planning committees, because we are seeing time and time again that when decisions are made at the local level with the support of local people and local communities, those decisions can be overruled because developers have the right to appeal and the Scottish Government uh, reporter then steps in and more often than not upholds the appeal against the views and wishes of communities and peoples. That cannot be right and that has to be addressed. So if we are serious about giving people a real say in their communities, then we need to address that imbalance between the power of developers over the power of communities, the power of people, and indeed the power of democratically elected planning committees. Like Emma Harper, I also responded to the consultation. And like Emma Harper, I do believe that if we can get this right, then it would be in everybody's interest to be able to develop uh, our communities and ensure that those communities have the type of ambition in them that is set out in this document. So I do hope the Minister, in praising people that, that, that support the aims, will listen to what they have to say and will take on, point, on view the points that are being made. And coming to that, the RSPB ask, and I would hope the Minister will, will address this in summing up, what are the next steps and will there be an opportunity for further pu public consultation, further public engagement? They also state that MPF4 recognises the dual climate and nature crisis 
but a wide range of representations have raised concerns that as drafted it will not play its part in halting biodiversity loss, let alone support nature recovery. So will the draft be amended to take into account these comments and the many, many comments that have uh, come across through this process? A key issue that comes up again and again is that any planning framework is destined to fail unless planning departments across Scotland are properly funded. And I'm not sure I've actually heard the Minister acknowledge the current state of planning departments up and down Scotland. I'm certainly not blaming the Minister. Over a number of years, planning departments, economic development departments have been disproportionately cut as part of the overall cuts that are going into local government. And as a result of that, I would contest that there are very few planning services across Scotland that will be able to deliver on the ambition that Emma Harper and I and others welcome. So that point must be addressed. I think COSLA have made the point, the committee have made the point. I welcome, presiding officer, the importance placed on addressing the climate emergency. However, there is not enough clarity for planners on how to deal with the emergency in the face of competing priorities, and in particular the scale of the housing crisis that we have in this country. If we are going to tackle the housing crisis, then we need to start looking at how we are able to use land. We need to give local authorities the confidence that they can start to, to be able to identify land and, through the legal processes, take land where land is needed to build houses for social good, the type of housing that is actually required. And councils must have those powers. Um, the issue of front loading is not addressed here, an issue I have raised with Mr Arthur's predecessors. There are major development sites, certainly in Fife, but I believe across Scotland, that are stalled right now because of a lack of front loading for investment in education in health. And whilst there are funds there for infrastructure in terms of roads, sewage, etc., there is no fund to support infrastructure when it comes to education, when it comes to health. Again, if that is not addressed, there are major developments stalled. So it really is the, the developers that can come up with the, the land that needs the, less, the, the least investment, uh, and for land in areas like where I live, where there is a 900 house development completely stalled because of a failure to put the infrastructure in. Those are just some of the issues that we need to address, so I do hope the Minister will confirm that there will be further discussions, further debate, and that we can see how we take on board all the points that have been brought forward. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Douglas Lumsden to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I would like to remind members of my register of interest that show I'm still a councillor at Aberdeen City Council. Uh, I'd like to start my contribution today in congratulating the Scottish Government in producing a draft framework that has managed to unite so many organisations in their criticism of the Government for the complete lack of detail in the framework. Like so much produced by this devolved government, it's full of headlines no one could disagree with, but lacking of any substance. And I hope the new version will address this. I'd like to also thank the committee for the work done and the excellent report they produced. And it doesn't take you long to discover the first big issue, and that's the capacity of the current planning system. And it was mentioned by Graham Day earlier. Local authorities have quite rightly bemoaned the lack of consultation and timing of these proposals. Coming at the same time as many of them are formulating the local development plans, these proposals have thrown into doubt. Those plans have caused a, a great deal of confusion and worry in our local government colleagues. LDPs are sizable documents that take years of consultation with our local communities. The measures outlined in the MPF 4 have thrown much of that into doubt, with changes to regulations that will bring additional strains to our already under-resourced colleagues. The conclusion of the committee report highlights this as a key concern. It states that even with additional funding, it is debatable whether this will be enough. Years of underfunding have left our councils in dire straits. And that is a point that was well made by Megan Gallagher and, and Faisal Chowdhury. But unlike um, uh, Alec Rowley, who does not blame the minister, I do actually blame the SNP. Uh, government. You know, this is many years of underfunded to local government that has caused 
this. And in the response from Homes for Scotland, they revealed the framework's failure to address the ongoing resource and challenges within local authorities, whilst adding to planning officers' workload with a raft of, at times, contradictory policies with no clear decision-making hierarchy. There is also a raft of new technical reports that will have to take into account. Reduced budget and more work for our local authorities is a recipe for failure. The committee have uh, also raised concerns about the lack of ambition in figures proposed as the minimum all tenure housing land requirement. This is echoed by Homes for Scotland, who point out that the tool used for calculating this relies too heavily on past population trends and fails to identify the full range of housing needs, with many excluded from this count. This follows a recent report showing that the cumulative housing shortfall since the global financial crisis is now approaching 100,000. The committee report asks the Scottish Government to develop a tool that is more up-to-date and fit for all areas of Scotland, and I hope the Minister will address this in his closing up. There is also concerns from our rural communities. We heard that from Finlay Carson and also Gillian, Gillian Martin. Sarah Madden, policy advisor on rural communities at Scottish Land and Estates, commented, we fully support the overarching ambition of MPR4, but unfortunately, there is a large gap between that ambition and the detail in the framework. We, of course, understand that the planning system needs to take the climate crisis into account, but addressing that must not be to the detriment of rural development. And many have criticised MPF4, focus on urban environments and not understanding our rural environment. The planning process also has to take account of infrastructure planning, and the link between MPF4 and infrastructure and planning is not clear. The Chartered Institute of Housing said, we also need to see land identification then matched with the appropriate infrastructure changes. And then we need to help planning authorities realise the connection between these national strategic plans and their own priorities. And when we look at infrastructure changes, the framework has little red lines, strategic connections they are called. There's one between Inverness and, and Perth and one between Inverness and Aberdeen. So surely now the government recognises that these connections are strategic and should therefore get moving with the full duelling of the A9 and A96. I must also mention and thank the Scottish Sports Association for their excellent submission to the consultation. You can see from the submission the, the opportunity this framework can bring, and I commend Scottish Sports Association Chief Exec Kim Atkinson for highlighting how important sport and well-being can be in a planning framework. As the first line in their submission states, fundamentally sport is fun, but it's also the golden thread which connects health, communities and equalities. And I would go further. Sport is one of our best forms of early intervention and prevention. And I would urge the Scottish Government to work with the Association and incorporate as much of their suggestions as possible into the MPF4. This will bring real-term benefits to Scotland's health and well-being. If the devolved government are serious about digital, then I would suggest full fibre connectivity into every new home should be mandated. Throughout the last two years, when working from home has become the norm, we have seen the need for better digital infrastructure accelerated. While MPF4 goes some way to addressing this, it is arguable that in the world we now find ourselves in, it has to go further. And I would ask the government to look again at this as part of the amendments that they will bring forward for the finalised document. And this is particularly important for our rural communities, such as my own. President officer, the MPF4 has much to say about my own area, the North East. Once again, it focuses on this idea of a just transition that we all support. But we need more detail. More detail needs to be in the framework on how the area will support our drive to net zero. There is no mention of the proposed energy transition zone and no mention of the hydrogen production hub. This SNP Green Government, once again, is full of words but little action. This policy will not deliver for the people of rural Scotland. It will not deliver the homes that are needed. It will not deliver the environmental impacts promised. It does not link up vital infrastructure we require. It places undue pressure on our local authorities that are facing continuous cuts from this government. This framework needs a lot of work, and I encourage the government to listen to all those who have contributed. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I now call on uh, Tom Arthur to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to eight minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking everyone for all of our contributions this afternoon? 
And can I also um, echo the thanks of many members, not just to the committees, but to the committee clerks and their involvement in preparing the evidence and preparing the reports. This has been very informative, and I think, for the most part, certainly, it has shown the Parliament at its best, the executive proposing, Parliament, Parliament scrutinising and providing a lot of thoughtful and considered input. And I think that while there has been much specific, many specific points that have been raised, which I will, I will come to in a moment, I think nonetheless out of what has emerged from this debate um, is in concert with the point I sought to make it in my opening remarks, which is that there is a consensus on the vision of what it is we are trying to do around NPF4. And central to that, of course, is climate change. And we can recognise the climate emergency. We can recognise the crisis in biodiversity. We can recognise the need for a just transition. But what we will be judged upon is the actions that we take. And ultimately, in politics, we have to make decisions. And one of the things that has emerged throughout this debate is where all of the tensions arise quite properly as part of the planning process, where decisions have to be made, where we have to confront the reality of opportunity cost. If you want to do one thing, then that perhaps precludes the possibility of doing another thing. But let me turn to some of the key themes that have emerged. Firstly, around process and how we will take this draft NPF forward. I want to be very clear that the maxim that I underpin my approach to this is that that which is done well is done quickly enough. My priority is not meeting some artificial deadline. It is making sure we get this NPF for right. And I am notwithstanding one, the, the, the final contribution from Mr Lumsden, I want to build maximum consensus across the Chamber. And I want to be very clear at the outset, I am open to meet with any member of this Chamber to discuss specific concerns around wording or policy or any aspect, aspect of the NPF 4. I certainly will. Does Mr Lumsden? I would like to thank the Minister for, for giving way. It's just around you know, the, the language that um, was mentioned earlier. Does he not agree with me that if it's too vague, that's, um, you know, there's no consistency across different planning authorities, and then that will just add to more appeals coming through to the Scottish reporter. Okay. Minister. I, I welcome the intervention and the constructive point the members make. I'm going to come on to clarity. And this is something that I, am, I want to be very clear. I am very grateful for all of the submissions we've received through the public consultation. From memory, I think a total of 757. This is going to take some time to work through and to consider it in detail and to consider it with the respect that those who have submitted these consultations deserve. And that will inform how we, take, how we go forward as far as our process is concerned. But we will give it all of these points careful consideration, both general points around language or structure, but also, and I'm very grateful to those organisations and individuals who have submitted views on this, precise wording and detailed wording, because we have to get the wording right. I think we can be agreed on policy aspirations, but we need to make sure the wording is clear. And I take very seriously the points that have come from heads of planning and others who have asked for greater clarity. Equally, I want to ensure that planners feel empowered and to take the decisions necessary to realise the vision within the NPF4. I think we also have to recognise that NPF4 cannot do everything. We have to also recognise the important role that planning authorities have in how we develop their own local development plans, and crucially, doing so in partnership and in conjunction with their local communities. Now, Mr. Rowley really raised the point around third-party right of appeals. That was, of course, debated at length in the last chamber, the last parliament, rather. And I don't want to rehearse these arguments. But one of the key points, that certainly, Finlay Carson. Uh, thank the minister for taking the intervention. You talk about uh, communities, and, and we've heard about appeals, but. Currently in Dumfries and Galloway, local council taxpayers are subsidising wind farm developers uh, to get their applications uh, put, put through the council. And the not fit for purpose planning department in Dumfries and Galloway are increasingly not uh, uh, determining applications within timescales. They are then referred to the Scottish Government, who increasingly are approving applications against the wishes of local communities. So how can uh, MPF 4 improve that, but given the assumption that there is going to be more support for developments for wind farms and, and more commercial planting, how does MPF 4 give uh, proper consideration to the rights of local communities? Minister. 
Okay. Firstly, on, on the point of communities, it is important to recognise the overwhelming majority of planning decisions are taken by local communities. Just for an example, in 2020-21, 25,000 applications approximately were decided by local authorities. The number that were decided on appeal, 135. So I think it is important to see that context. On the point about resourcing, let me come to that. I respect the autonomy of local authorities to set their own budget. But I think we recognise that from across the Chamber the clear necessity to ensure that we are, our planning authorities are being resourced to achieve what it is we want them to achieve through this. Now, where I have been able to take action and have taken action is on planning fees. And from the 1st of April, earlier this month, planning fees, almost all planning fees increased by between 25 and 50%. And early projections are suggesting that for some local authorities, this could mean additional resources between £600,000 and over £1 million. That is action I have taken at the earliest opportunity to help with the resourcing of planning departments. And Heads of Planning is working to ensure that best practice is shared. I would like to, but I do need to make some progress, unfortunately. Now, a specific point was raised around renewables. Renewables, of course, are at the heart of um, our ambitions to meet our climate obligations by 2045. And I recognise that we have to ensure that the ambition within N uh, NPF4 is commensurate with our ambitions around, for example, onshore wind and other renewables. So the commentary that has been received on renewables and specifically on policies uh, pertaining to renewables will be considered with great detail. The issue around monitoring and delivery has been raised as well. Let me say on delivery, we will publish a delivery plan along with a finalised version of NPF4. Now, while there is no statutory obligation for the delivery plan to go before Parliament and to be voted by Parliament, I am welcome to appear before the committee, not just on NPF4 and its finalised form, but in on, uh, to take questions on the delivery plan. As I have stated, Previously, as has been recognised for some time, NPF 4 is not a capital spend document. There are existing funding streams available. But what the delivery plan will do is help to coordinate a lot of these funding streams and make clear how, the, how that resource links up to the ambitions within NPF 4. The important thing to recognise as well is that the delivery plan will be a living document. It will be continuously updated. It can't be something static just to sit on the shelf. So as such, there will be an opportunity for continuous scrutiny through that. That will also provide a vehicle for monitoring. Other point I want to raise before I conclude, Presiding Officer, is on the issue of housing. I am very grateful to Homes for Scotland for their considered contribution throughout the consultation pro process, and I will give careful and detailed considerations to what they have submitted. The important point to recognise is that the math of which has been referred to is a minimum. It is not a, a target, it is not a cap, it is a floor. And there is an important role for local authorities in developing their local development plans to set out what their housing land requirements are for their local area. And that indeed can be informed by the most up-to-date data available. I apologise to members who have not been able to address their points, but I just want to reiterate I am grateful for the considered contribution of all the committees, of the contributions to members this afternoon, and my door is open to any member in this chamber who wants to meet, who wants to discuss specific issues around NPF4. I believe if we work together and get that shared ownership, that shared parliamentary support, we can deliver an N NPF4 that is equal to the vision and ambition that is set out in it, which I think we are all agreed on. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Willie Coffey to wind up. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer, and I'm actually pleased to be finally closing this important debate on behalf of the committee and to reiterate my thanks to the committee members for their contribution, the Clark and team in Spice for their, their help along the way. Now, before reflecting on some of the, the excellent contributions made in the Chamber this afternoon, I wanted to cover a few of the points in her report that the convener did not cover in her opening speech. Um, firstly, the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods. The committee welcomes 20-minute neighbourhoods, and we note that stakeholders recognise this as a good planning concept. There are undoubtedly, however, very significant challenges associated with delivering on 20-minute neighbourhoods, whether it is a new development, an existing urban setting or rural or island context. Careful consideration will need to be given to what a 20-minute neighbourhood actually means and how it can be achieved in specific cases. And many of the members mentioned this this afternoon. Communities will need to be involved in shaping the places in which they are to live. And amongst other things, there will need to be a focus on infrastructure 
and sustainable transport to deliver on those ambitions. The committee welcomed the Minister's recognition of the importance of SDPR2 in delivering on 20-minute neighbourhoods, but in the final version of NPF4, we would welcome further information from the Scottish Government on how it intends to deliver on 20-minute neighbourhoods across Scotland, and in particular in our rural and island areas, where the challenges of creating 20-minute neighbourhoods would appear to be most pronounced. Say a few words on the rejuvenation of our town centres too, if I may. Both in the committee's formal sessions and in the informal sessions held by the committee, members heard various concerns about the decline and dereliction within our high streets. I should say it wasn't a universally negative picture, though, and the committee did hear about positive examples of town centre regeneration. In particular, the committee was impressed with the work being take, undertaken by Celebrate Kilmarnock and Mahone constituency, which has driven community-led regeneration there. And our visit to Govan to hear about their regeneration plans was really impressive to hear. We need to give careful consideration about what we can do to affect the rejuvenation of our high streets. So, but we didn't come to any conclusion on the best mechanism to achieve this, and this needs further work. We did, however, welcome the Minister's commitment to affecting an improvement in our 10 centres through NPF4 and other initiatives, and we will be paying close attention to how that progresses. We are keen to see how NPF4 and any other powers available can be deployed effectively in order to improve the town centres, and I am sure we will all return to that issue later on in the session. We also considered the minimum all tenure housing land requirements, MATLA, as we refer to it, and it set out the minimum number of housing units that local city, region and national park authorities must plan as a minimum, strength emphasised by the Minister earlier, to accommodate in future development plans. Each planning authority in Scotland has been presented with a minimum all tenure housing land requirement, and each has been invited to present an alternative scenario if they wish to do so. Many of those we did hear from though, raised concerns about those figures. While we noted that these are merely minimums and not a cap, we were concerned that having minimum, minimum targets might limit ambition at a time when we need to be ambitious to meet Scotland's housing needs. Turning to some of the, the members' contributions, Presiding Officer Gillian Martin reminded us that health and wellbeing must be a strategic priority, with health inequality impact assessments at the heart of the process. And Finlay Carson, on behalf of his committee, told us about the importance of community engagement and the continuing need to provide access to housing in rural and island settings in particular. Miles Briggs reminded us once again to pay more attention to the concerns of the renewable sector and the potential impact on future housing needs. Mark Griffin made some, some, some really helpful points, I think, and he, he, while he reiterated some of the concerns in renewables and how it will affect us delivering on the demands for housing in the future. So Mark strengthened one or two of the messages that I think were commonly shared by members around the table. Graham Day, who made a, a significant contribution even in his short time at the committee, focused on the capacity within our planning departments, and that concern was expressed by a number of members around the chamber. And uh, last but not least, Graham Simpson graciously accepted the blame for this entire debate taking place in your opening remarks. And, but of course, he strengthened the need for greater clarity and to take out some of the more woolly language that appeared in the report. Finally, Paul Sweeney, I think, mentioned an issue that is very close to the hearts of most of the members when he asked us to consider the look and feel of shop fronts in our high streets. It was also a great concern to the committee, but we did not come, come to any firm conclusions about how best to tackle that. Presiding officer, agreeing to the final version of NPF 4 will by no means be the end of this journey that we are on. As a committee, we will be continuing to pay close attention to the contribution NPF4 makes to effecting a change in Scotland's planning culture. As recognised by the convener in her opening remarks in the debate, one of the biggest challenges to the success of NPF4 will be in finding enough planners to help deliver it, and we expect to pursue this throughout the rest of the session. And with that, President Officer, I will draw my remarks to a close. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on National Planning Framework 4. It is now time to move on to the next item of business.
Point of order, Ariane Burgess. Uh, presiding officer, yes, I would like to give my apologies to you, your deputies, and my colleagues across the chamber, and everyone supporting this very vital uh, debate this afternoon for being late at the start. I recognise the impact it's had on everyone, and I trust that it won't happen again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Burgess. I appreciate your comments. As a matter of courtesy and respect to other members and to this Parliament, it is essential that members contributing to debates are in the Chamber at the right time. Most business follows on from other business. Timings offer guidance to members, but it is really important that members follow proceedings closely to ensure that they are in the Chamber. Um, when we would expect to avoid any delay to parliamentary business or indeed any reduction in the parliamentary business we are able to get through. I now move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 4061 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on setting out changes to this week's business. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you very much, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Stephen Kerr to speak to and move Amendment 4061.1. Presiding Officer, I rise to move and speak to the amendment to the business motion in my name. This amendment should not be controversial. It simply reinstates the debate on long COVID that the Scottish Government proposed just three weeks ago when the Parliamentary Bureau last met. A debate that should not have been cancelled at the last minute. My colleague Dr Sandesh Gulhani has been calling for a long COVID strategy since before he was elected. He knows what he's talking about. He has seen what is... Well, I'm very surprised to hear dissent from members of the Scottish National Party to the idea that Dr Sandesh Gulhani knows what he's talking about, because he does. He's seen, he has seen firsthand what is happening in the lives of thousands of people suffering from long COVID. And he also knows what's being done elsewhere in the United Kingdom, yeah. what is working. Before recess, I really believed that Thursday's debate was a promising start, a recognition that there is a serious problem, a recognition that this SNP government has failed, and the start of redressing that failure, and perhaps I should say more fool me. Maybe it's because there's an election in a couple of weeks' time that there is to be an embargo on any criticism of the SNP Scottish Government in the Scottish Parliament. Our Scottish Parliament perhaps is, perhaps is to be sent into slumber without any controversy for fear that the SNP policy might be exposed for what it is. The Minister for Parliamentary Business, George Adam, says that a debate will happen when the Government has something to say. So I conclude I include they apparently have nothing to say on long COVID, or as he may wish to put it, they are not ready to say anything on long COVID. Well, ministerial statements are for government announcements. We had a... Said, yes, I'll give way. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Would the member agree with me that with no clinics, no in-home support, and with not a penny of the support fund having been spent, many long COVID sufferers are being left behind here? And would he also agree with me that it is sorely disappointing that the only debate on long COVID in this Parliament has been in opposition debate time, a Liberal Democrat business day last November? Absolutely. Stephen Kerr. I have, I have every sympathy for what uh, the member says. In fact, I believe, I believe in respect to the timetabling of business this week in this Parliament, her party has been shown a great discourtesy by, by the SNP. Uh, we had a scheduled debate on long COVID, and that debate should go ahead for the sake of our constituents and their health concerns. This Parliament exists to scrutinise the executive. The SNP don't seem to get that, but that is what the purpose of this Parliament is. Perhaps if the SNP were less tenured, they might hear something in a debate, uh, uh, ideas that they might wish to pursue. Frankly, this Parliament hardly needs more evidence that the SNP don't have answers. They are remarkably devoid of ideas, as we can all attest. So, Presiding Officer, the thousands of people suffering from long COVID must wait for concerted action, such as has been proposed by my colleague Dr Golhani. I will give way. John Mason. 
Would the member accept that uh, many people with long COVID, including my constituents, are being treated right now? Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. Well, I can only reply to the member about the post bag I have from those family members of those who are suffering from long COVID and their concern that little concerted treatment is available to them. Instead of having a debate, those constituents and their families will have to wait. Those constituents suffering from, from the effects of long COVID, struggling with extreme tiredness, shortness of breath, problems of memory and concentration, heart palpitations, joint pain, their patients, their sacrifice is being made to save the SNP ministers from a difficult afternoon in Parliament, from having to sit here and answer a few questions and listen, I will give way. I, I noticed presiding, notice presiding officer one or two SNP MSPs pointing at themselves and saying they have long COVID and they are being treated. Well, look, it's all very well for a well-known MSP to be receiving treatment when they see their GP. I have to tell you as a constituency member there are many of my constituents who are not being treated and who are looking for solutions from this parliament. In conclusion, Mr I will, wind, I will wind up, uh, uh, presiding officer. Um, the SNP and the Greens will undoubtedly line up tonight to prevent an open debate on those who are suffering from long COVID and their treatment. It is disrespectful to those suffering long COVID. It is disrespectful to the Scottish Parliament to be used to shield the SNP from criticism. I hope I am wrong and the Minister will hear these arguments and relent, but I fear on past form, presiding officer, that he will not. Thank you. I call on George Adam to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Up to five minutes, Minister. Thank you, <laughs> presiding officer. I felt I had explained this earlier today to everyone in the Bureau in a very open, honest and transparent manner. But I will once again endeavour to articulate our position. And it's not the position that uh, Mr Kerr said where I said there was nothing for the government to say, we had nothing to say in the matter. Everyone that was in the room knew that's not what I said. What I did say, what I did say, presiding officer, is there are real people dealing with real issues at the end of this, and this government needs to ensure that when it puts anything in front of this parliament, it is strong enough and robust enough to deliver for these people and these real people dealing with these real issues in their lives. <laughs> and on the other matter, presiding officer, this debate that has been postponed to enable another debate, the Scottish Government, to provide parliament with an update on Scotland's multi-sectorial multi One Health approach in addressing global health threat posed by AMR. This is on Thursday, an important topic I am sure every one of us in here would agree. But what I will say in answer to some of the rantings from Mr Kerr <laughs> is that we do intend to bring the long COVID ba uh, debate back to Parliament after the local elections. <laughs> it appears, it appears pre uh, presiding officer, that council season has started. Minister, colleagues, I'd like to hear the Minister. Thank you. Minister. It appears that panto season has already started, presiding officer of the opposition. This very short postponement will allow ministers to provide a fuller update on the progress as this will not be bound by pre-election period restrictions. Ah. The Scottish Government's intention yeah. is to provide Parliament with a detailed update of the outcome of the a thorough planning process currently being undertaken with NHS boards to determine the first allocations of the long COVID support fund. Presiding officer, I sincerely hope this puts the minds of my opposition colleagues at rest on this matter. I will inform the Bureau when the long COVID debate can be brought to chamber in the normal manner. He is here. <laughs> Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Of those who are watching these proceedings, can you confirm there is nothing about the pre election restrictions that would prevent a debate on long COVID happening in this Parliament on Thursday? Thank you. Um, pre election announcements are a matter for the government. So we will now move on to put the question, which is that Amendment 4061.1 in the name of Stephen Kerr which seeks to amend motion 4061 in the name of George Adam on setting out changes to this week's business be agreed. 
Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.